All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Crisis Jam. I'm Lindsay Browning, um, the Director of Medicaid Programming at the National Association of Medicaid Directors, and I am delighted to be back as your host for today. We have a fabulous featured presentation lined up with uh, Damali Alston and Kate Peterson, um, who are going to share about one local managed care entity's uh, approach um, to meet community crisis needs. So really thrilled to uh, hear from them a little bit later in the episode. Before we get to that, though, um, we always like to start with a, a couple um, of things things to know, uh, things on the radar. And the first one, if you joined us early, um, you, you saw, you got a preview of this question, um, but we want to ask the group, and, and please drop your thoughts into the chat, um, what you think Governing Magazine identified as the top five social issues to watch in 2024. I'll give you a hint that we wouldn't be asking this as a teaser uh, if there wasn't some connection to the work we all are doing here, um, but would encourage you all just to drop those, those thoughts into the chat. And we'll reveal the answers later. So, so go ahead and give your thoughts on what you think the top five social issues governing identified are. Um, just a reminder, you can access all the resources from the Crisis Jam on talk.crisisnow.com. Uh, that's where you can sign up for the newsletter. That's where you can register for the Crisis Jam. And again, a reminder that yeah, everybody should get their own individual link for the Crisis Jam rather than sharing those links that helps keep the space safe and secure. Uh, and again, you can watch some of the videos there and check out articles and resources. Um, as a reminder, uh, we're always looking for new ideas um, for featured presentations. We've had uh, 400 uh, unique speakers since the Crisis Jam launched in 2020, uh, and we're always looking for your ideas about who would be a good uh, featured presentation um, for this room. Next slide. And you can see here just some of the folks that, that have done it to date. Um, we want to share a couple of news items with the group, as always. Uh, the first one is a Washington Post article, actually a series of articles um, that have featured um, some, some recent action in D.C., some um, legal, legal action from um, community organizations uh, about police response to individuals in mental health crisis care. Um, I think the articles explore that that while um, there have been progress to build the crisis response system, um, that there's simply not enough capacity and, and police continue to, to be a predominant responder to mental health crises. Um, so it looks at some of the uh, some of the legal challenges, legal action emerging uh, there. Next slide. We also um, want to give a quick shout out to the NAMI Reimagine Crisis Newsletter, which is where we lifted um, this piece from. Um, but there is a great uh, synopsis in there um, of some legislation that Representative Tina Orwell, um, who I know is a regular contributor to the Crisis Jam, um, so the legislation that uh, Representative Orwell has introduced uh, in um, uh, the House passed, actually, uh, in Washington State that would recognize crisis responders um, uh, and the need to safeguard them from civil liability. So we have a short video to share of Representative Orwell talking about this uh, legislation. The bill in front of you is really about providing protections and tools for people working in behavior hall to help those in need in our community. You know, with 988, we have this incredible chance to redo our crisis system. And we know that there's a place to call, which is 988. And now we're working on someone to respond and a place to go. And so when people call 988, about 95% are resolved on the phone, but about 5% need a mobile response. And we want to make sure that those clinical teams that are going out are protected um, because it is difficult work. And we're asking a lot of people to go out rapidly and to go into a lot of different situations. And so a Again, we provide these kind of protections to other people to do this line of work, and we'd like to extend it to people doing behavioral health because at the end of the day, we want people to get the services that they need and deserve. Urge your support. So really interesting to, to see that action and curious from others across the country if uh, that type of legislation is being debated or proposed in your states. Uh, would love to hear about it. So please drop that in the chat. 
Um, we want to flag some upcoming events, um, particularly if you don't already have plans for the summer uh, and you are part of this Crisis Jam community, um, you are invited to join um, the Crisis Now Global Summit uh, in Amsterdam, June 29th through 30th, 2024, so this summer. Um, it, this will be the, the third one that has been done. It's really just a phenomenal event. So mark your calendars, plan to, to join for that. If you do already have plans to travel to Europe this summer, maybe you're going to the Zero Suicide event in Liverpool or the other match opportunities happening um, in, in late June, um, you can tack on the Global Leadership, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Crisis Now Summit um, onto those events uh, and join in uh, the Netherlands as well. Um, so if you have questions about that, you can ask Karen and, and the team at RI International, um, but I hope folks will uh, join us for that uh, great event. All right, now we are going to go to the trivia hot seat. Um, I'm going to invite Chris uh, Santasaro to join us. Chris, I think this is your first time being in the trivia hot seat. Um, just you want to tell us a little bit about sure. who you are and then we'll get into the question. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Lindsay, and uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is Chris Santacero. I'm with Connections Health Solutions. I'm our Vice President of Government Affairs, and in that role, I have the privilege of advocating at all levels of government, um, literally um, for our model of care. That's uh, 24 hours, uh, no wrong door approach to crisis stabilization and observation. So excited to be here today. Um, it's been an honor to be a part of this group. One of the first things as I started with Connections um, and been around the country traveling in, in this field, as I've heard about the, you know, the crisis jam and how, um, what a re wonderful resource it is um, for everyone in this field and this vocation and the great work that everyone does. So look forward to the question uh, today, being in the hot seat, and also look forward uh, working with everyone here to advance our call as we um, work to build out 988. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks for being in the hot seat. Um, here is the question we've got for you. Uh, in Crisis Jam episode 36, the co-founder of Connections Health Solutions, Dr. Chris Carson, described crisis facilities that served everyone. Uh, so our question is, which of the following did Dr. Carson state was needed to start effective crisis care in a facility? Option A is prior medical clearance in a hospital ED. Uh, option B is submission of a referral information packet. Option C is report of blood alcohol level if intoxicated. And option D is ring the doorbell. So we've got a phone a friend. You can phone a friend if you want. We've got the poll of the audience open right now. But any initial thoughts as people are giving giving their input? I, this is what I love the most. And I'm, I don't want to um, prejudice the, the poll right now. But this is one of the wonderful things. Um, that I makes my job easy, quite frankly, other than you know, obviously having Dr. Carson, also Dr. Balfour, I'm sure everyone on the call knows. Um, but this is what I'm most proud of and advocating at all levels of government for. It seems um, unthinkable, but it's true. So I'll, I'll let the poll continue on. Thank you, uh, David, if he's on uh, for the layup. Um, but um, I'm just, uh, I was I thought he was going to really try to uh, stump me here. But um, this one's pretty easy and why I love um, being at Connections, being a part of the, the crisis movement and um, advancing our model for for um, everyone's benefit throughout the country. So um, I'll, yeah. I'll, when the polls finished, I'm curious, I'd like to just curious to see what the results are, but then I'll. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad. Um, so, yeah, it's it's literally you know, number, I'll officially say D, and for the nine and six percent, I just want to say um, those are typically the things we get asked when we're first trying to enter a community is, you know, the hoops and ladders, unfortunately, that folks face when they're trying to build out a crisis system or when they need help. And I, I think that's sadly the, the, the situation a lot of communities are in where they need medical clearance because the providers need to be safe in caring for those individuals. And they do require, other providers require medical clearance. Other times in healthcare, someone, if you need a, a, a knee surgery, heart, you know, they want to look at the, the packet, uh, the healthcare packet, the referral packet, um, or they want them to be screened for um, their blood alcohol, other, other substance use things, because they're a mental health clinic 
not a substance abuse clinic and vice versa. And they kind of get folks, unfortunately, get ping ponged around. So, um, you know, the wonderful thing about our model and about a lot of the great crisis providers out there, a true no wrong door model is ring the doorbell. The clinicians, the IDT will be there to help you help that individual get care quickly, get treatment quickly, stabilize the individual, de-escalate the crisis, and then kind of connect to you know, community-based services um, post-crisis. Uh, so um, thanks for that. It, um, I, 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 think official, I think it's official, but, you know, D is my answer. And I, it's just, you know, great um, showcase of, of the work that a lot of the great crisis providers in the country do. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And, and I suspect you won't be so lucky next time you're in the hot seat. Yeah. It's probably going to throw you a trick question, but I uh, <laughs> really appreciate you, you doing it. Thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and um, move back to this question of Governing Magazine and what are the top five social issues to watch in 2024. Some of the things we heard were um, democracy. Um, I think there was a, a, a piece around um, uh, mental health access, access to treatment, but let's go ahead and see what the answers are. So the five here are crime, fentanyl, immigration, mental health, and poverty. Uh, for those who are early, you may have seen that Ruben got it right. Ruben, I think you looked it up, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but these are the five that they they raise as the areas where um, lawmakers will be focused on kind of these, these social issues this year. So probably resonates with a lot of folks here. All right, so let's go ahead and turn now to our featured presentation. Um, really thrilled to welcome uh, Kate Peterson, who is the um, Director of Healthcare Network Project Management at Alliance, uh, and Damali Alston, who is the Senior Director of Provider Network Evaluation uh, at Alliance. I'm really excited to hear about the great work you guys are doing in North Carolina, so I'll turn it to you. Great, thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, really appreciate being here. So just a couple of things. Want to talk a little bit about who we are. So we are a managed care organization um, and we cover now seven counties as of February 1st. And you can see us in that kind of uh, peachy, kind of darker reddish color. And as you notice, we're a little bit disconnected. We've got one county down at the Southern part of the state and then we have uh, the rest all kind of in a, a little grouping there in the middle part of the state. We cover mostly urban areas. Uh, and so all of our counties are pretty urban in nature and we cover two of the largest in population, Mecklenburg and Wake County, where uh, Charlotte, North Carolina and, and Raleigh is. Uh, and together we have a population in those seven counties of about three and a half million. So um, although we have a small number, we have a lot of people. And so we cover uh, those counties for Medicaid, and today it's behavioral health. Um, we will be moving into a tailored plan, which will mean we'll manage behavioral health and physical health care um, to provide whole person health at, at some point here in the near future, potentially July. Um, and just historically, we became a managed care organization in 2013. So that gives you a little background about us. Go ahead to the next slide. All right, so where we started in 2013 is we covered four counties and we had three facility-based crisis programs, uh, Wake, Cumberland, and Durham. We covered also Johnston County, which is just south of Wake County and where Raleigh is. We had mobile crisis teams um, and we used emergency rooms a lot. So we really were overusing emergency departments. We were seeing long lengths of stays in our facilities, very limited throughput, um, lack of dedicated space for children and adults who happen to be doing assessments in those facilities. And um, so it, it was a pretty big challenge for us as a newly started managed care organization. You can go ahead to the next slide. So, Again, we weren't really happy with where we were. So fast forward, now we're a couple of years old. Um, and we had we saw our programs as having no real core model, long lengths of stay, long EMS and law enforcement drop-off times. 
And one thing I didn't put on the slide, but is true, we had a lot of um, diversions, meaning the facilities were full, they ended up turning people away. And we certainly didn't want that. We wanted a model that conformed with, at the time, SAMHSA's published form elements. And we really wanted a more of a recovery orientation and peer support infused. Go ahead, next slide. So we, we actually went across the state. <laughs> I looked at every program. Our uh, board reviewed a, a matrix of what was going on across the state. We looked at national models and we decided we were gonna issue a, a RFP. We were gonna transition one of our longest standing programs and RI International got that basically because there were several elements that they used in programming that we really wanted. You know, we're on door, peer support, and we really wanted to focus our, our, our work. And you'll see here a picture of Durham, and I know that uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later too. But that was the first facility we actually started really looking at models for. Let me go to the next slide, please. All right, Damali, I'm turning it to you. Okay, so, you know, with RI taking over the Durham facility, we really did shift to a model that used their um, kind of living room and retreat approach for 24-7 behavioral health urgent care services. Um, we immediately saw and continue to realize shorter lengths of stay and drop-off times for our law enforcement. We no longer have, you know, law enforcement sitting with members for 30 minutes, an hour or longer, while they're waiting for them to, to enter in through triage and assessment into the behavioral health urgent care with um, RI. It literally is down to, I believe it's like less than 15 minutes. They have a quick drop off so that law enforcement can get back out in the community and they're not continuing that presence and that setting with our members um, so that they can really get into more of a um, peer based and um, clinically appropriate setting without kind of that, that involvement of law enforcement also hanging over them. Um, one of the other things we also want to look at was we continue, even though we had this amazing program, we continue to have concerns with the inappropriate use of our um, emergency rooms for folks in behavioral health crisis, but we're not rising to the level of a um, harm to self or others type of crisis needing an inpatient admission. And so we started looking at the concept of behavioral health urgent care programs that are very similar to your medical model of urgent care. When you go, they assess your kind of what's your immediate crisis at the moment. You don't get a full, um, you know, health screening, so to speak, but they're addressing you're showing up with flu symptoms. They're going to test you for flu, make sure, you know, they may test you for a couple of other different things and then treat you and send you on your way. And so we did develop programming in two of our counties in Durham and then a year or so later in Wake County with two of our behavioral health providers to stand up this behavioral health urgent care concept um, so that folks could use that as an alternative to emergency room use when their crisis was not to the level of self-harm or harm to, um, harm to self or to others. Next slide. All right, so 2018 also, we started the development of a, a facility for children and families that provided a 24-7 urgent care and facility-based crisis. Um, we purchased an old hospital, we renovated that, and it had mold asbestos and lots of other really fun stuff from the 60s and 70s. So. We, it took a very long time and I uh, see a picture of it. We are open in for the urgent care and soon to be open for the facility-based beds. Um, we, it, this, this model was basically when we started talking about it and our board looked at us when we did the research on the adult models, we, you know, said, so we've got another issue here. Why are we having children and families present in the same spaces um, as we do adults? And we're not focused and we're not 
really looking at the needs of both populations. So we ended up doing getting a grant from the state for the million dollars, which helped us purchase the facility. Underwent a lot of renovation, as I said, and, and here you are. So we do have this program now. Very excited. Uh, I think it's one of the only ones that has walk-in uh, assessment capability 24-7. And we are very pleased that we added this to the array. The only regret we have is not having it ready in 2020, as you can imagine. All right, next slide. So where we are now, and you know, this has been a long road for us figuring out what our community needs, how we should need to structure ourselves, what kinds of things we need to be developing to fill the, the gaps in our continuum. So we have shifted models and, and we're working with RI and a couple other facilities. Um, we have opened that crisis center for children. We've extended the behavioral health urgent care hours beyond where we started in 2018. Um, we're also looking at ways to do mobile crisis. Mobile crisis in, in North Carolina is still under Medicaid as a fee for service um, program service, and we're we're struggling with that. Um, and so we're exploring ways to make it more of a firehouse model, uh, figuring out how we can fund that, and that's really where we want to be. So although we're not there right today, that's where we want to go. Um, we've developed uh, mobile outreach response engagement stabilization. That is based on New Jersey's MRSS model. And we have teams in all of our counties. And it serves children and families using peers on the team. Um, and we are that's been actually a newer addition to our crisis services. And we've really ramped that up in, in 2021, 2022. So we're very, very excited about that. We've had some really early successes uh, keeping kids out of the hospital and certainly keeping kids from our Department of Social Services offices, which is happening way more than we want. Um, and then of course, we've, we've still got, and we've continually had a robust CIT community partnerships and supports, and we are uh, very present in every community. Um, all right, next slide. So we also have our crisis stabilization and transition programs, which is uh, residential, small residential homes for youth that are either being boarded in emergency rooms or in, in Department of Social Services office. So we created rapid admission um, and we created several programs across our catchment to serve these kids. And that's been uh, certainly a challenge, and, but it has really, really helped our system with having fewer kids in uh, those kinds of settings and, and boarding and EDs. And offices are no place for kids. I mean, we have really worked hard to get them out of there and I look at Mecklenburg County, um, where Charlotte is, they joined us in 20, late 2021 and had a very long list of kids in custody. And we saw those kids hitting that office quite regularly. And that has changed significantly um, over the last two years. We also have worked with an organization for a service called therapeutic relief, which can be deployed uh, for kids in uh, services where they have a real high risk of disruption. So we can provide one-on-one -on -one for those kids. We can also do it as part of uh, a service we can do with uh, kids that are boarding at DSS offices inappropriately um, until we can get them settled in a longer term situation. We've created an um, other 24-7 um, behavioral health urgent care with the Steve Smith Family Foundation. Uh, it's in Charlotte and it does serve adult and children, but it also has dedicated space for either. Um, we 
open that. And that has been, at this point, the only uh, urgent care in, in the Charlotte area, which is, again, one of our largest areas at probably around 1.2 million people. Um, we also, again, developed those MORS teams to uh, really, they respond when, uh, what, for whatever reason the caregiver calls. So they will respond face to face. They can work with stabilization up to eight weeks uh, and to connect to services. The family peers on the team are really, really critical. And all of our teams do have family peers. My next step there is to add uh, youth peers to those teams as well. We've you know, created the facility-based crisis, which isn't quite open yet, but we're getting there. And then of course, we actually really patterned this continuum in children and families after the national guidelines. So we've got our crisis call centers, so and someone to respond in a place, safe place to be. That was our goal. So we're really hitting on all three of those at this point in time. Next slide. Okay, so we also have um have had a couple of pilots going um, and support. There are two co-responder models in Wake County and in Mecklenburg County. And that's where we're pairing um, mobile crisis staff with EMS staff or with police departments. So that as those either EMS or police departments are responding to behavioral health emergencies, um, instead of those you know, being transported directly to an ED, so to speak, those mobile crisis teams can intervene and work to help stabilize and maintain individuals in the community and link them to additional behavioral health resources. And we have seen early successes with those as well. Um, we have had community um, paramedic programs and continue to have those in Durham and Wake counties. Um, that's similar to CIT in that the um, paramedics are, are trained in behavioral health interventions. Um, and so they're not quite kind of that co-embedded EMS and mobile crisis, but they are first responders that have training in behavioral health crisis intervention. We um, also have um, peer respite and recovery hub under development in Wake County. We're working with an agency, PRN, who has those programs in Mecklenburg County, and we are funding them to establish those services in Wake County as well. Um, the peer respite program provides up to three to six guests a time that they can, a place they can stay for 10 days or longer. Um, and it's accessible to anyone with or without insurance and without the need for an assessment, authorization, or referrals. Um, it's not part of the standard kind of MCO utilization review, right? It's a peer run um, respite facility. Um, they can be used as emergency department diversion, as a planned or unplanned stay, or for someone that's transitioning out of inpatient services back into the community. Um, and for individuals in the ED that are not in need of inpatient stays but need the additional support. They are also establishing a recovery hub that provides a safe and recovery-oriented, peer-run, trauma-informed community setting for individuals with mental illness to access peer support and social connections. And that facility also, or that program also supports the individuals that are in the peer respite program. Um, of course, we, you know, have the 98 um, line, but, you know, with in North Carolina and all of our counties and the peer warm line through PRN as well. Next slide. So let's talk about some of the challenges and opportunities we have um, before us. One thing that um, I didn't say about North Carolina is as we are developing this tailored plan, we also have standard plans, which are um, health plans that are serving folks for more of your lower level behavioral health needs, outpatient, med management, et cetera. Um, they do have a crisis continuum. And I think one of the challenges is infusing um, the crisis continuum and making it standardized for all payers, um, not just us. So as a quasi-governmental organization. So we'd like to see more investments across the entire state with all across the entire payer system. 
Um, we also, you know, want to see more supports before crisis. We want to see um, respite. We would like to see more of the programs like the MRSS model where we can get people before it's an acute situation. Um, we also want to fund firehouse mobile crisis. We talked about that. We really see the need to be available in MC for that. And you know, I see a lot of questions, which I'm looking forward to getting to. And and of course, fun, the, you know, one of the biggest challenges we have is funding and time to develop. I've been very fortunate that I, I have a team of uh, four that work with me. And we are charged with managing the projects to fill the gaps. And it is, a, it, it is a challenge to stay on top of all the things we really want to do. So uh, that's funding and time is a lot of the challenge that we will continue to face. All right. I think we can get to the chat and some questions. Wonderful. Well, let's see if we can get to these questions before we turn to our round table. Um, the first question is around whether the facilities accept individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, including autism. Um, I know there's been a lot of conversation around uh, making sure, you know, cr crisis care, behavioral health systems have capacity to serve those individuals. So just curious if you can say anything about that. Let me talk about the children's side of that first. Um, and the, the children's side on our um, child facility-based crisis, we actually have some sensory-friendly rooms, and we intentionally developed the facility and selected the provider for being able to serve children with IDD and autism. Our Valley Thrive. See so that was very exciting. And um, the, the other thing that uh, we have been doing is in those crisis stabilization homes, is we've created a couple of those that specialize in co-occurring disorders so that we can definitely serve those kids. On the adult side, it's less clear, I think. Um, I think that we are going to serve people no matter what coming in the front door, but we're gonna try and get them to the right type of treatment. And that has been a challenge. Um, Damali, do you have anything to add on that? Um, not, you know, facility side. I think, you know, I think all of our facilities, you know, because of their crisis in nature are going to accept, you know, members as they come in. But I think that is that challenge, right? Once you stabilize the initial crisis is really ensuring that you're linking to appropriate services to meet their needs. Um, and so that can, you know, on within a crisis facility, um, that can be, I think, difficult at times for folks with an IDD, a co-occurring disorder. And so I think that's always a challenge, um, but something that all of our facilities are also, you know, trying to work to overcome. I know that on the mobile crisis side, we intentionally um, are ensuring that all of our um, IDD behavior health providers have um, contracts or memorandums of agreements with mobile crisis teams in each county. So they do have that level of support um, within mobile crisis to be able to respond appropriately and have the clinical su support for our IDD members. Yeah, and I would just add one more thing is that one of the things that's uh, a project on my team's list and hasn't launched yet there's actually some um, direct service personnel training and one of the curricula is around um, crisis response. So uh, for our IDD providers. Great, I, I know we're coming up on time. So maybe I'll just ask for a super fast response to the second question. Anything you can share quickly um, around interoperability kind of data exchange um, in your all's work? Ah, no HIE yet in North Carolina. Um, and so that is a huge challenge. We have systems still that don't talk to each other. And so I think for us, that's that's still a, <laughs> another challenge that we need to continually work on. And data sharing, obvious agreements are difficult. Yeah, yep. Well, thank you both so much for sharing about your incredible work. Um, really fascinating to, to hear kind of how you guys are building out the crisis care continuum. Um, I want to shift to uh, Joy Brunson 
Nisugaba, um, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Recovery Innovations, Inc. Uh, and Joy, we'd love to just hear your reflections um, uh, on the presentation uh, we heard today. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with the Alliance team since uh, 2015 when we started uh, the Durham program. And, and I think my, my reflections on what they have presented um, really just showcases their uh, diligence to wanting to be very evidence-based. That, that was one of the important pieces when we um, moved into operating the, the Durham facility um, with them. That's when um, in North Carolina, um, Recovery Innovations transitioned from a more uh, rural approach um, with our crisis facility to uh, urban area. And, and so one of the things that we um, have been working with them very diligently on, specifically in Durham, is all of the ideas around how to make sure that we are working with the population we have and in the community. And so we've piloted so many ideas and projects um, along with the Alliance team, as well as the communities there um, to ensure that we are providing the services that are, are needed. Um, some of them have worked really well, um, in, including the implementation of, of MAT in, in the crisis facility and some others. Um, we found that it was better to partner with uh, some of our community partners. Um, so uh, just looking at, at their slides, I, I think it just showcases the whole continuum and then the continued ideas. Um, we, we have not gotten to the end of or a perfect system, but continue to in, improve upon it. And so, like I said, we, we worked with the Alliance team since 2015, starting the Durham program in 20, uh, worked with them since 2015, started it in 2016, and we continue to look forward to continuing to work with them on all of the new ideas and evidence-based practices. I love that reflection of, you know, reflecting how far the system has come, right? How much work you guys have done, but still the opportunity to continue evolving and learning and addressing gaps um, and, and building those evidence-based practices. So really appreciate that. Thank you, Joy, for, for those reflections. I want to go ahead and shift us now to our standing updates for the crisis jam. Um, and we're going to hear first from SAMHSA. So I'm going to turn it over to Richard McKeon. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yep. Great. So I wanted to let folks know about several convenings and pieces of work that are coming up um, this coming Friday. Uh, we are hosting a convening with fire and emergency medical services. Um, and we are looking forward to that. It's modeled after one that we similarly did around law enforcement in coordination with the Department of Justice last year. Um, and I only learned, you know, as in, over the last couple of years about the deep interconnectedness between fire and EMS, um, and which is, was an important piece of understanding the overall system. Um, also related to this area of coordination with 911 public safety answering points and emergency medical services, there are two pieces of work ongoing. SAMHSA's Mental Health Policy Lab is uh, coordinating an effort um, focusing on uh, when 911 versus 988 should be contacted. Um, that is something that should be um, finished later this year. And Vibrant Emotional Health is also working uh, around um, uh, liability issues in 988 and uh, uh, 911 uh, interactions, um, which I think uh, the relevance of the proposed law in the state of Washington is of great interest uh, given that. Uh, second, in the beginning of April, SAMHSA is uh, sponsoring a policy academy, I believe it's for six states, um, on crisis systems design. Um, and um, obviously, SAMHSA has been promoting the model that's in our national guidelines. Well, this is a policy academy uh, to help states who are really wanting to do some design or redesign work along with uh, uh, subject matter experts and others. 
And then finally, in the beginning of May, uh, we are sponsoring a 988 grantee meeting. This is a grantee meeting for the, uh, I think it's 54 states and territories who receive SAMHSA's uh, 988 grants. Um, our um, tribal 988 grants, our crisis center follow-up grants, um, as well, of course, as uh, Vibrant. And, the, and so we are anticipating widespread um, participation across the entire uh, 988 uh, uh, call center world. So this will be the first meeting of its kind. Uh, we did have two meetings in over the last 15 years, which were all call center meetings that SAMHSA held, one in uh, New Orleans in 2007, then another one in uh, Baltimore that was around 2014. But this is the first time we've been able to do something like this since 988, and we couldn't be uh, more excited about it. So that's what I have. Thanks for the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. Sounds like a lot of uh, exciting work going on and especially convening folks um, uh, around these issues. I'm going to turn it now to Wendy Morris uh, at NASHPID for the NASHPID update. Wendy? Great. Thank you so much. It's uh, great to be here today. So I just have a couple quick updates. And one is actually just a quick update on the Link Center, which was featured in episode uh, number 157 just last month. But I'd love that um, this issue of serving folks with co-occurring uh, mental illness and intellectual and developmental disabilities came up during our feature presentation. And there was some conversation about that because that's exactly what the Link Center is doing. It's a five-year cooperative agreement with the Administration for Community Living to develop a national resource center to really build the capacity to do that work, um, to really better serve people with co-occurring disorders. It's led by three associations, NASDAQ, the National Association for State Disability, uh, Developmental Disability Directors, NASHBIT, and then NAD, the National Association for Dual Diagnosis. Plus, we have multiple other po um, partners to help us focus on um, diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as continuous quality improvement. We have a steering committee exclusively made up of people of lived experience. And our goals, there's three, realize system change, develop clinical capacity, and improve service access. And we're doing that by engaging with expert contributors, learning from our steering committee, and then I just identifying information, resources, trainings, and gaps. But the, the piece this audience is probably most interested in is, is another policy academy. This is different than the one that Richard spoke of, but it is um, a collaboration with SAMHSA. And it's we also invited six states to work with the Link Center um, to really build that um, 988 and crisis response system for uh, folks who have co-occurring mental illness and, um, and IDD. So super excited. We had our kickoff those the formal announcement about the six states is yet to come, but we already had our first kickoff meeting. These states have some fantastic ideas and they're going to do some great work. And we're going to be excited to bring back to you a lot of those lessons learned and, and what other states can, can follow. So I will put in the chat um, that episode 157, as well as there's a, a, an email. If you have further questions, you can email me or the link center. Um, the second update I wanted to just give was on NASHBIT's Behavioral Health Workforce Resource Guide. I think we've talked about it um, in updates in the past, but we just released um, the third version of that update. I'll put that link in the chat as well. The audience is really for state um, mental health authorities, but it, I think a wider audience would uh, probably benefit from it as well. It's got a ton of examples about work folks are doing to build their workforce um, capacity across the states and territories. So just all kinds of examples of what's being done and how it's working. We did seek out updates and outcomes from previous projects for this version, and it's very clearly marked what's new. So if you've read it before, it'll be easy to find what's been updated and what's been added. Um, and this workforce guide, if you haven't seen it, is it follows a framework developed by the National Conference of State Legislators, really trying to help us have a common language. And there's five key categories, uh, understanding workforce needs, increasing the supply, expanding reach, addressing distribution, and then uh, retention. And again, if you have questions or if you'd like to contribute to the 2025 um, 
version, we would love to hear from you and I will put my email in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. All right, um, now we're gonna turn to my favorite topic because it's the world I live and breathe in, um, but our, our Medicaid uh, segment. Um, so I invite Tom Betlack, uh, who is a partner at Spire Healthcare Strategies uh, to join us. Tom is a former Medicaid director uh, and former budget director in Arizona. So Tom, take it away. Lindsay, how are you? Great to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks, thanks for having me today. You know, we've had these segments monthly, really just to highlight how can Medicaid come along and help support the crisis system. And during these segments, we've heard from a, a number of different states. It was great to see the presentation from the Alliance today in terms of really highlighting how progress is incremental in terms of these large delivery system changes that they've been driving towards in North Carolina. So just wonderful to hear that. Last month, we talked about a New Year's resolution of let's engage Medicaid, let's bring Medicaid to the table to see how we can advance crisis systems in our state. And this month, we thought it would be great to leverage all the subject matter expertise on this call and really get some feedback in terms of where you think in your world, Medicaid can come along and help support crisis system development and evolution in your state. And so for that, we have a, a question that we'd like to put up and get your feedback on. And you can reply in terms of checking multiple boxes here, but we wanna really hear from you all in terms of how you view the Medicaid organization in your state as a partner in terms of accomplishing different things to help support the crisis system. So the first area is financing, the bank of Medicaid. Obviously, Medicaid has access to resources, through its structure and programs and Medicaid's involved in setting rates and identifying covered services and populations. But at the end of the day, Medicaid can help deliver financing around the sustainability of the crisis system. The second is leveraging the delivery system. So we heard about the Alliance and the managed care structure in North Carolina, um, or is it a fee for service structure? So how can Medicaid or is Medicaid a partner that you can go to to really help think through how you're going to leverage the delivery system design in your state in terms of contracting requirements, performance expectations, who the providers are that can participate in this? The third option is to assist with stakeholder facilitation and convening. Um, you know, we heard from Dr. Richard in terms of all the work that SAMHSA is doing to convene partners. Medicaid can also serve in that capacity to bring in providers, stakeholders, law enforcement organizations. And, and we're just curious if that's something you view as an opportunity to partner with your Medicaid organization on. The fourth area is technical support with CMS. So there's a lot of rules involved in terms of being able to have access to financing streams. Um, and the Medicaid agency is in a place to help in terms of advance. We heard about mobile response earlier and the ability to get the state plan amendments through and all the other technical issues are involved in terms of the world of Medicaid and being able to be a technical partner on that front. The fifth area is subject matter expertise. Now we recognize in many states, this oftentimes comes from a separate organization that's responsible for behavioral health, but there may be some expertise in your Medicaid agency. And so do you view Medicaid as a source of being able to go to in terms of having some area of subject matter expertise? And then the last area that we hope doesn't get checked but we just wanted to offer it is none of the above. And so just trying to get an understanding of if uh, there are states or, or you view your Medicaid organization as not being able to help you partner with any of these. And then of course you can uh, identify an other that we'd love to hear about in the chat if you want to identify another area that you feel Medicaid could be a critical partner in, in terms of providing some other service. So with that, um, you know, if we can just tabulate the responses, we'd love to see sort of what this group thinks in terms of uh, where Medicaid can help support. So 56% financing, how to leverage the delivery system, almost half again, assist with stakeholders uh, facilitation, a third, technical support. So if you have technical issues, hopefully you view your Medicaid agency as a conduit to being able to help resolve some of those issues with CMS. They, they certainly serve in that capacity. Subject matter expertise, it's actually a higher percentage than I thought. And so, Lindsay, I'm not sure if you have any responses to this, given where you sit and this is your everyday work and looking at these results. 
Yeah, I think this is fascinating and just really appreciate folks, you know, including multiple of these options. You know, I think something we often hear a lot from, from Medicaid folks is that they can be really helpful in sort of the delivery system design pieces. Um, and, and it's valuable to have them at the table early um, because they may run into barriers around financing if um, some of those technical considerations of what federal policy allows um, weren't considered at the outset. So I think the bottom line here that I would reiterate is, is engaging your Medicaid partners early around this work is key. And financing is a huge opportunity, but there are other certainly other places where they can be a fabulous partner. Well said. Couldn't have said it better myself, Lindsay. So hopefully folks are taking that New Year's resolution to heart to engage Medicaid. And here's some opportunities that you can be thinking about in terms of how to do that early and often. So with that, we'll turn it back to you, Lindsay. Thanks for the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tom. All right. I want to turn it over to uh, Stephanie for our legislative updates. Stephanie? Yeah, thank you so much, Lindsay. Good to be with you folks. Um, so with it being late February, we are just about at the halfway point for most states who legis whose legislatures are meeting this year. Um, I certainly won't touch on everything, but just a few highlights for you. Starting in the state of Florida, um, you may have seen news of um, Senate Bill 7016. This is called the Live Healthy Act. This is a very broad um, health care package, really focused on the health care workforce, but most relevant for this group. Um, there are some great provisions in there to improve and expand mobile crisis response in the state. Uh, specifically, it uh, creates standards for mobile crisis teams, um, such as just an example, um, requiring a response within 60 minutes. Um, it requires the state's Medicaid agency to seek coverage and reimbursement for mobile crisis. Um, so that pairs very well with um, uh, what Tom was just saying, and also just uh, requiring them to maximize federal funding for mobile crisis response. And then there's there's direct funding in this too, $11.5 million that will reoccur each year to um, enhance mobile crisis teams and um, ensure coverage in every county. Um, and the really exciting part is this has already passed both chambers. This is just awaiting the governor's signature at this point. A few other states I wanted to highlight um, uh, Vermont right now is actually considering a 988 telecommunications fee bill. Um, it's a 70 cent fee, but that would actually go towards multiple purposes. Um, I will say Vermont has a very unique telecommunications fee structure. So this bill is structured a little differently, um, but that is also moving through the process um, as is Maryland has a 988 fee bill and it will actually have its first hearing kicking off in just a few minutes, I think. Um, and I know we had that great clip um, from Washington State at the top of the call. One other Washington bill worth um, mentioning real quick is Senate Bill 5853. Um, this has made it halfway, uh, well, more than halfway through the process. It's passed the Senate, it's through its House committees, just needs a floor vote. And what this does, and it, it extends Washington's 23-hour crisis relief center model to um, people who are under 18. And of course, um, if you are kind of interested in doing deeper dives on any of the bills I've mentioned or any of the bills pending in our tracker, um, just a reminder to be sure to join our um, 98 state advocacy calls that are once a month, first Monday of every month. So we have one coming up this Monday and I'll put my contact information in the chat if you wanna join those. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, now I want to shift to our crisis talk uh, and invite Stephanie Hepburn to join us, um, the Editor-in-Chief of Crisis Talk, um, and Ron Phillips, uh, who this week's article focuses on. So, Stephanie? Stephanie, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for letting me know. Um, yes, yeah, so I... I'm happy Ron is here. Uh, he's the chief nursing officer at East Tennessee Children's Hospital. And Ron, when we spoke, you told me that behavioral health visits in your emergency room have been on the rise um, and partnering with McNabb has helped. Um, you specifically talked about two innovations that we've mentioned before actually in the jam, uh, but it's great to get your perspective and your lens on the innovations. Uh, could you share what those were and also what are kids struggling with in your emergency room when it comes to behavioral health? 
Well, I'll start with the second question first, because for whatever reason, we know what the reason appears to be, we will have our busiest February ever in our ED. And it, it spikes this time of year every year right around um, Valentine's Day. And we'll see a spike in our teenagers. Well, we did see a little bit of an increase. It's a little bit early to measure, but they just announced in the last three weeks a new part in Tennessee where they will hold kids back in fourth grade if they haven't passed their third grade exam. So that's where we saw a spike last year. So both of those age groups are influxing a little greater than we thought they would at this point, mm -hmm. um, which is disheartening, um, obviously. So that's what we're seeing a little bit of right now. We'll see another spike if it holds true to in prom season. Again, very distressing, um, but the bigger one there will follow right along in March, April when the comprehensive assessment scores are done and the testing is complete. We'll see that. As far as innovations, I think the, the one thing that we recognized very quickly um, when I took this role as CNO is that we are not a behavioral health facility. We're an acute care hospital. Mm -hmm. So leveraging a partner like McNabb um, to use their expertise and doing something different, building a crisis stabilization unit inside of a hospital. Um, we had an area that wasn't used, um, not typically done for behavioral health, uh, but it actually worked very, very well. I think if you look at two things, those are the things that we did. Um, we're leveraging who we partnered with and then building something totally different. Can you share a little bit, um, you know, having it on the fourth floor of the hospital, what does that look like? What are some of those hurdles that needed to be addressed? Well, well first of all, it is, it's McNab Helen Ross McNabb's facility. It's in our building, mm -hmm. um, but it's theirs. So that was the first hurdle was letting our staff understand it's not our program. This is mm -hmm. Helen Ross McNabb. It's their floor. It's theirs. So very few of our staff have access to that area. Uh, mm -hmm. The exception, because they are in a hospital, we have to be able to respond to emergencies, to disaster, to code. So we do have that access, uh, but it's very limited. Um, so doing it that way, having that unit that is literally an elevator right away from our ED, and then working so well with our crisis walk-in center that actually started before we opened, so that they're, they're feeding kids there. So if you ask what I think has made the biggest difference is mm -hmm. the number of children they see at the walk-in crisis center that they can funnel to outpatient services or to the CSU if they need it as opposed to coming to the ED. That's phenomenal. Um, hopefully other states, and I think you mentioned that there's some other states that are replicating this. Uh, what are something that you would like to share with them um, from the start of the process? I think from the very, very start, there was a lot of hesitancy about how was it going to support itself? Mm -hmm. um, what was it going to do? And from our, our perspective as a hospital, it didn't matter as much because we're already covering those costs in our ED. So mm -hmm. if I can take those children out of our emergency room, uh, I think also leveraging grants from SAMHSA and other places that, that see something different and are willing to experiment and try and show data that made a difference. Uh, so our, our governor has signed this year in our budget, there will be two more walk-in crisis centers and CSUs that will be funded from the state one in Middle Tennessee, or let's see, yeah, Middle Tennessee and one in West Tennessee. So National and Memphis. So there'll be three of them. So we're working with those, trying to help them see where did we do things that we would have done differently? Mm -hmm. um, what could we do better? Uh, and also we're looking now, we're working with McNabb at, okay, how do we loosen up some of those restrictions that they've got of what they'll accept to try to continue um, to decompress? And I saw something in chat has it licensed. It's licensed through... Um, McNabb. It's a behavioral health unit. It's not part of the hospital. That was one of the other hurdles was making sure that everybody knew it is not part of the hospital. But you still, from fire code and all those things, we still have to meet hospital standards. But licensure was McNabb. It's the mental health piece. So the nice thing, I'll say this for those of you who are familiar with hospitals, when Joint Commission comes, it is not a surveyable area under Joint Commission because it's not my license or tax ID number. Well, thank you so much for hopping on with me, Ron. Please take a look at the article. Thank you. Thank, you. To thank you both so much. Really uh, incredible to hear about that work happening uh, in Tennessee. 
Um, just a couple of reminders as we come to the top of the hour. Um, the latest episode of Moving America's Soul and Suicide is out. Um, we really encourage folks to share the link with your network. We want to make sure that that's uh, available far and wide. Um, so please grab that link from the chat and share um, via social media with your with your personal network, etc. Next slide. Um, we have a couple of great episodes coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, next week, join us for a conversation um, about uh, hiring peers with a criminal justice background. We know this is a perennial topic for folks, and we're really excited to, to revisit it here on the Jam. Next slide. And then the following week, two weeks from now, we will hear from Stacey Owens um, about service members, veterans, and their families uh, and crisis services um, in, that, in that space. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to our presenters um, for a fabulous conversation. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you here same time, same place next week. Take care. <laughs>